Join us and Neighborhood Cats for all you need to know about Trap New to Return, TNR, and Colony Management. You'll learn the basics and walk away with the tools you need to be successful in helping outdoor cats. Workshops are typically held the first Saturday of the month. Registrants will have the opportunity to earn a certificate. For more information and to register today, go to communitycatspodcast.com. You've tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today we're speaking with Molly DeVos. Molly is a certified feline training and behavior specialist, a certified cat behavior consultant, and a fear-free certified trainer, founder of Cat Behavior Solutions and host of the weekly podcast, Cat Talk Radio. Molly specializes in using positive reinforcement to modify and prevent unwanted behaviors in cats to help keep families together. Molly was voted one of the top 12 extraordinary cat behaviorists of 2020 by catpetclub.com. Molly, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you, Stacey, for having me today. I'm excited to chat about cats. Yes, it's very exciting. And we're trying something different today for our listeners at the Community Cats podcast. Molly has her own radio show, and we're going to do a co-show today. So we're going to talk back and forth. We're going to have more of a conversational dialogue back and forth between each other and talk about different hot topics that we've seen. But, you know, before we jump right into that, Molly, uh, you know, give us a little bit of a background on, you know, how did you become so passionate about cats? Well, I spent most of my early time volunteering in shelters and after a few decades and, you know, back in the day, gosh, that's, you know, live release rate was maybe 30, 35 percent. So I was very passionate to try to save as many cats as possible. And and fast forward to my passion became let's keep them from getting into the shelter in the first place. So in doing research on why people surrender their cats to the shelter, a lot of it are the nuisance behaviors, you know, aggression, not using the litter box, destruction, intercat aggression, things like that. So I developed a nonprofit that has amassed a lot of information that's free for people to to just resource to try to keep cats in their homes and stop those behaviors. That's excellent. One thing I am finding, and tell me if I'm wrong based on your experience, is during this period of time where we have uh, been experiencing COVID, not new news to anybody, uh, behavior issues have increased substantially. They have behavior issues have increased substantially in it. And it's been a variety of things. It's change, right? Which sets cats on their ears. Either they're not used to people being home. And then all of a sudden there were a lot of people in the home during COVID or they got the cat during COVID and now they've gone back to work and they're having some separation anxiety issues and, and things like that. And then in, in your ballpark, I'm also finding that a lot of people are kicking cats out You know, because the shelters are busting at the seams and are doing managed intake, right? They're taking appointments and some of those appointments are a month down the line or more. And they say, I can't deal with this cat peeing in my husband's shoes for another month. And so they open the door and they kick them out and the cat becomes homeless. So I'm seeing that too. Wow. That's incredible. And, and it's really challenging to hear that, to see that. I think there's a lot of frustration. There's anxiety, there's emotion. There's just a lot going on right now in the animal welfare field that at least that I'm sort of sensing. Um, And, you know, one other thing, you were just talking about cats out in the community, right before we hit the record button, you were talking about somebody who had found a litter of kittens. You know, when I think sometimes feline behaviorists, I just think, oh, yeah, it's like you said, litter boxes, cat trees, clawing on furniture, those kinds of topics. But you also have a pretty serious involvement with community cats. Uh, Tell me a little bit about what your perspective is around community cats. 
Yeah, I get a lot of people who find community cats and then have questions about how to deal with them, whether they're trying to socialize them and bring them into their cat family or whether they're just trying to manage them outside and trying to understand how to provide for their needs as an outside cat. Probably the biggest thing I see, though, is, um, you know, cats seeing outside cats through their windows and then redirected aggression happens because, you know, cats don't often display their emotion and they're sitting there staring at a cat that we may or may not see out there. And then you go to pet them and they turn around and bite because they're just wound up in, in territory protection aggression. Or if you have multi cats and they see cats outside, you know, they'll, they'll start fighting within one another. It's a very common trigger for intercat aggression. So I often have to help people with humane deterrence, how to keep those cats from crossing their yard, how to block the view so that their indoor cats don't see them because it's in a cat's nature to protect its territory. So it's not like you're going to change the way the cat feels about seeing those outside cats, you know? Does it make a difference whether or not those cats outside are already spayed or neutered or not, or just the visual makes them crazy? Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not being based on scent at that point. It's being based on, I see a cat and it's coming into my territory because in the wild, when they're not supported, you know, in an, in an urban setting with feeders and things like that, cats are very solitary. They don't cohabitate in groups and in colonies and they defend their territories. So when cat indoor cats see a cat outside, they don't really cognitively understand that it can't get in. I've seen them run to other ends of the house because the cat will go out of sight around the corner and they'll run to that bedroom, you know, that's in that direction thinking that the cat's going to get in. And so they're doing what's natural to them. They're, they're defending their territory from a potential territory invader. You know, they're not necessarily known to be resource guarding like dogs are, but in this instance, they very much are because their territory is their domain and they're highly territorial creatures. So it's it just the sight of outside cats can just wreak havoc on indoor cats. And I have lots of people that just ignore that and then continue to feed their outside cats in view of their cats. And they have, they'll end up with urination issues. I, I had one case, I have this amazing photo, big house, complete glass on the back. And they were having urination issues along the window. And so I had suspected that they were probably seeing a cat outside. And I'm sitting there talking to the owners, getting the initial questions answered. And I look up and sure enough, here's this big black furry cat just sitting about 10 feet out staring in the window at us. And I'm like, does that happen often? And then they're like, oh yeah, that's the neighbor's cat. I'm like, yeah, well, here's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I, you think, oh, I'm being so nice to, you know, let my cats have some visualization. And and if you do a catio too, and then you have the cat yes. out in the catio and then they're even closer, um, that's challenging. And I'll say I have personal experience with taking a cat that's been living outside in my backyard that I wanted, I brought into the house to try and acclimate, even though my cats at that point in time were indoor outdoor. So they had conflict outdoors conflict from within. And then I brought that cat in to, and I had to try and keep the peace. And it was very challenging, very, yeah. very, very challenging. But a lot of people do, they bring cats and kittens in from outside and they try and acclimate them to the cats that they have indoors. How would you recommend people do that? He gads. Well, I oftentimes tell people don't do that. I tell them, make sure those cats are spayed and neutered. And if you're sure they don't belong to somebody and they're kind of happy living outside, then they're very resilient creatures, as you know, you know, and go ahead and let them live out there as long as they're not procreating and everybody's okay with it. But if they insist on bringing them in, there is a long, slow introduction process because they're so territorial. It's very hard to introduce a new cat, regardless of where they came from, into a cat household. So it's, it's, but I usually try to tell them not to. And, you know, that there's a whole, bunch of different definitions of community cats, right? You've got feral cats, which I don't even like that. I call it the F word. I, I try to, I try to get shelters to quit calling them that. It's like, cause they're not all feral, right? They're, they're community cats. 
So they're either a cat that's never been socialized and living outside, or it's a cat that is actually owned somewhere and it's indoor outdoor. And it, it, you know, it may think there's four or five houses up the street that own it. It eats breakfast at Sally's and lunch at Todd's and, you know, <laughs> and, then, and then it may sleep with John, you know, so they're, they're kind of just are free roaming cats, but they're social and, and they're, probably owned in some loose um, definition of that. So there's a, a real wide definition of community cats, don't don't you think? And do you run across that as well, trying to define kind of what you service? Oh, sure. Definitely. The way I define community cats are uh, cats that have four paws on the asphalt or the concrete. Yeah. And, and or that, the dirt. <laughs> you know, and that our objective is to ensure that they're spayed and neutered, you know, and that that the, the community is looking out for them in whatever way works best for the community as well as for that cat. So if you're talking about a 14 year old cat that's arthritic, you know, it may be time to bring that cat in for sort of the end of life time period, which a lot of caretakers struggle with. When is it time to bring the cat in at that, at that end of colony life, I would say uh, to the very young kittens, you know, that are, that are under, 16 weeks of age and you know when do you trap them when do you bring them in when are they separated from mom how do you put mom back to the community that that mom came from but in my world a community cat is any cat that is outside and it's got his paws right up there on the ground now i've heard a statistic that says that there are about two percent of the community cats nationwide that might be spayed and neutered no real way to obviously get a number on that, but is is that what you would say also? Probably on average nationwide, that's probably true um, because there are certainly parts of the country where there's very little TNR going on, trap, neuter, and return, trap, neuter, vaccinate, and return, depending on how you want to phrase it. Uh, so there are areas where there's very little going on, and then there are areas where it happens very frequently. So uh, you'll have higher spay or neuter rates there. Um, in New England, it's probably a higher percentage, but um, other parts of the country, I, I would be surprised if it was much higher than that. Yeah. Here in the Southwest, it's it's got to be real, real low. And it's hard, you know, working with shelters. That's a real, a real issue that they have to embrace and make a decision on how they're going to deal with our, our stray cats. Because it used to be that, you know, the, the stray cats find their way into the shelter, either a, a well-meaning citizen traps it, brings it in, or, you know, animal control brings it in, however it ends up in the shelter. And if it is a true community cat with not much much socialization, it's going to react very defensively aggressive in a shelter and be deemed unadoptable. So it used to be we would just trap kill, you know, right. and, and that was the biggest percentage of cats that were euthanized in shelters. And then thankfully with Million Cat Challenge was probably one of the first ones that really started to, to make an effort to educate shelters that, hey, they don't need to do that. Let's just spay and neuter them and put them back where they came from. If they are owned, they'll find their way home. And if they're not owned, they were surviving really well on their own before you came along and brought them in the shelter. So get them out. And and communities that have done that and have embraced that, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, I, I think that it's hard to look at a, you know, three month old friendly kitten and think that you're going to spay and neuter it and then just go dump it on the streets is kind of a lot of the ways that that feels. But in reality, you know, if that cat is that friendly, it it probably belongs to somebody and it'll find its way back to its house. Because the, the sad fact is that, you know, less than 2% of people actually come into a shelter looking for their missing cat. Because if it's indoor outdoors, they're used to it being gone 24, 48 hours. So I, I personally support return to field for all strays, but not all communities are, are ready for that. Right. I mean, I was privileged to be raised in uh, a managed TNR environment uh, in Newburyport, Massachusetts. So we started out with 300 cats. We had 14 feeding stations back then. We had a list of volunteers fed twice a day. It was all monitored. The cats had profiles at each feeding station. Wow. So it was very, very intense. Uh, and by 2008, we had no more cats living on the waterfront. Wow. So the whole colony 
you know, aged out. Um, you know, the first year they pulled 125 cats and kittens off the waterfront, put them up for adoption, adopted them out, and then they returned the rest. And by 2008, everybody had aged out uh, and retired. And so then they closed the last feeding station on the Newburyport waterfront at that point in time. So they went from 14 down to zero. So, oh, wow. yeah. And, and it's been, so it's a real testament of the fact that it can be done. It, it is very targeted. I mean, it was really an intense targeted project that was very successful. And I was able to craft a, a, a adoption center that was open admission, no kill for a service area of 10 towns. So, which was a population of about 125,000 people. So we really, we, we really opened the door for communication with the community because there was no concerns about them showing people showing up with cats that needed assistance. We were like, it's okay. That's what we're here for. We triage, we balance for that. We, the, the drop-offs we used to have, I had 10 cats dropped off once on a Sunday morning when I arrived at the shelter with my, my daughter to, to work, to do my volunteer stint on Sundays. And they were just left in carriers on the back. And I know we're all familiar with this, with people abandoning right outside of a shelter or abandoning at our feeding stations. And we try to be really careful about making sure our feeding stations are tucked away. And all of that stopped when we sort of opened the doors to the adoption center. And we were just like, we're just here to help. Whatever you need, we'll help. If you just need spay neuter. You can keep the cat if you need spay neuter. We'll get it. We'll get the cat spayed and neutered for you. You know, if you need us to hold the cat for a month or two, um, we've even held cats for a couple of years where, um, you know, a woman was in the army. She had to be deployed for a couple of years. We fostered her cats for two years. So when she came back, she could get her cats back. So, you know, it's like, let's think outside of the box. What what do we need to do for your your community I and mean, your family? And um, it just it gets very exciting to me to realize that there are these possibilities in every community. And we just need to be a little bit more flexible, I think, about how we're approaching it, because there are different challenges. In July, when it's kitten season and it's crazy, I have different challenges than I do in the Northeast, at least in February, when you know, there isn't a kitten season going right. on. And, and I know the South has a whole range of different challenges and they need much more spay neuter capacity. We have a veterinary shortage going on right now. It's yes. going to be going for the next 10 to 20 years. We have to start thinking outside of the box, be able to do, to get more spay neuter for these cats. I think it's a public health emergency that we're not able to get these cats spayed and neutered. And I would love to open up some freedoms for veterinarians to be able to get more cats spayed or neutered. A neuter for a cat is not a big deal. It no. doesn't take very long. So November, National Neuter Month, let's just neuter every cat out there. It's not going to hurt the situation. And I think right. it will help tremendously. So those are some of the, the things that rattle around in my mind. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. You were able to provide that service to the community. I mean, that's that's amazing. Yeah, we're having a serious vet shortage here. I mean, serious. It's 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 hard. Cats and and dogs are both sitting in the shelter after being adopted for weeks on end, just waiting for the clinic to have a spot open up. I mean, that's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. How can this be happening? You know, at this at this point in time, that's. I, I just, I don't, I don't get it. It's hard to wrap my mind around it. And it's hard to know what to do because if there just aren't enough vets out there, what do you do? You know? Right. right. Well, and the compensation structure is changing significantly, which puts an additional pre pressure on the nonprofit organizations. Uh, in addition to the hat that I wear at the community cats podcast, I'm also on the board of the United Spay Alliance. And they're really trying to look at some different potential solutions around this issue um, and, you know, also, if you're a nonprofit and you are running a spay neuter clinic, I know that it has become very popular to have a wellness arm also. So you're going mm -hmm. out to the community, you're doing vaccines, you're providing wellness services. And I am for that 100% of the time. However, I do think we need to look at our triage of our community and is the wellness or the spay neuter you know, what's, how does that balance out? Doesn't a lot of that wellness come with that spay or neuter? So you're going to get an exam. You're going to get vaccines when, when you're bringing an animal in for spay and neuter. And so when you're weighing the use of your resources and we are at a critical point, we may want to go a little heavier on the spay and neuter and lighten up on the wellness for this period of time while we're trying to play some catch up. 
Yeah, absolutely. Especially for the community cats, you know, and then there's working cats and that's a whole nother arm, which is kind of a community cat because it's a, it's a cat that we've adopted. I use that quote adopted out to an individual who is going to use them for, you know, natural pest control. So oftentimes we'll get um, stray cats, community cats brought into the shelter that we have no idea where they came from. They were either dump and run or the intake person didn't get a significant, a sufficient enough address to be able to take the cat back. So, and the cat's not social. What do we do with it? We don't want to euthanize it. So we adopt it out as a working cat. You know, we have people with, with barns and stalls and warehouses and, and things like that, that you know, that are looking for cats to, to be mousers. So that cat community is, is similar. And yeah. we don't, we don't invest the same amount of resources for those cats that we do the ones being adopted. Like we won't FELV, FIV test them because it doesn't matter, you know, if we're returning to the field or they're going to be an outdoor cat, they're going to be exposed to it in the community. Anyway, we don't, it's not like we're going to treat it, it, it. We don't really care if they're going back to where they, they came from. So yeah. Yeah. It's... No. And I, I've had a lot of experience with what I would call barn relocation programs or working cat. And, you know, and the acclimation process is so important mm -hmm. um, as well as I have always encouraged folks to try and have some sort of a containment area, you know, the barn or attack room or something that they can get the cats in at night. Cause usually night is when the nasty stuff happens. And so we have tried to encourage for tricks, tricks of the trade is, and maybe as a behaviorist, you might have ideas on this, but, you know, feed wet food at night as the treat to get them in the door yeah. or get the catnip out or make the noises, do the clicker training, those kinds of things to, to say they're just barn cats and just leave them be. That's not a hundred percent true. There's, there is some engagement and work that you have to do to be able to keep those cats safe. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, I helped acclimate um, cats that we brought up to a feed bin here where we are and, and they have a, a warehouse situation and they, they had of course a warehouse with stored of the bird seed and dog food and stuff like that. And of course, horrible, horrible mouse and, and rat infestation and the normal, you know, mouse traps and things like that weren't working. So the guy wanted working cats. So we gave him three and then became the problem. Well, but you close the doors at night and you lock up the building. And, you know, how do we, how do we make sure these cats are in before you close the store? So it was exactly that. We put the cats on a routine that you feed them early in the day. Do not leave food down. Don't free feed them by any means, because then they don't have a lot of motivation to come back. And then I told him about a half hour before you close, they close at five. So at 4.30 was the schedule, put out your wet food and do a sound you know, whether that's ringing a dinner bell or something kind of loud because they're outside and they might be, you know, half a block away, not paying attention, hunting, chasing something down. So make a loud sound like Pavlov, you know, it's, the, it's a classic Pavlov's, you know, routine. And then, you know, the cats will get used to it where they hear the sound, they'll come if they've, if their internal clock is off for, for whatever reason. So yeah, food is, is the way to motivate cats to be you know, to show up when and where you want them to show up. <laughs> Team Dubert is at it again, and now they have an amazing companion case management module that once again revolutionizes how you rescue animals. Dubert partnered with Dallas Pets Alive and the Spay Neuter Network to build a powerful solution that allows you to manage cases of any kind. Whether owner surrender calls or emails, community cat tracking and reporting, Dubert is the only system that integrates two-way text messaging, automatic follow-ups, and even a rehoming solution that every organization can use. No more trying to manage 10 different technologies when everything is all in one place and tightly integrated. From fostering to transport, fundraising to e-commerce, supply and demand to case management, Dubert has everything you need to streamline your operations so you can focus on saving more animals. Check out the new companion case management module at www.dubert.com slash CCM and get signed up today. Ever wanted to quickly connect, collaborate, or problem solve with others in the animal welfare field who are, you know, real people? Look no further than Maddie's Pet Forum. 
Batty's Pet Forum brings people of animal welfare together with the common goal to keep more people and pets together. We share ideas, expertise, offer each other support, resources, and more. Visit forum.maddiespetforum.org slash cats. Maddie's Pet Forum, come for an answer, stay for the community. Um, I have a question for you with regards to the veterinary shortage in the private sector with your clients uh, that, you know, if they can't get in to see a private practice veterinarian for many months down the road, a lot of behaviorists will say, you know, you need to see the vet first with your cat to rule out any medical issues before I will come in and consult. How are you handling that challenge? Well, actually, I started carrying a product called Cat Checkup. And it's a it's a litter box litmus test, basically, that'll show, you know, it'll indicate high levels of, of problems and potentially glucose, things like that in the urine. So it might indicate that we're dealing with some medical issues. It certainly doesn't replace a vet visit, but um, I usually tell people start there. If it's a litter box issue and you can't get into the vet for, you know, another couple of weeks, Let's get this kit out to you and let's get that done so that at least we kind of know what's going on. Um, Other, you know, other issues, that's the main one. You know, I don't usually, I will have them see a vet if it's an aggression issue that has come on suddenly and it does sound like the cat may be experiencing some discomfort. And, you know, they really need to know is there, is there pain, is there sensitivity developing in a particular area? And I usually base that on how old the cat is, how well it's been fed, you know, that sort of thing. So mostly the urination one is the one I absolutely say we've got to rule out medical because it's going to be a waste of everybody's time if, you know, we're working on behavior when this is really a medical issue that needs some antibiotics, you know? Yeah. But, but it's hard. I mean, my own personal cat, you know, I, I was trying to get him in for a dental. I had actually done a, a base pause DNA test on him when he was little, he's only two. So I'd done that a little over a year ago and everything came back wonderful, no health markers, his dental was all green and just great. And then I did it again last month and all of a sudden his dental is showing that he's at high risk for dental disease and tooth resorption. And I look in his mouth and I'm like, well, sure enough, he's got some tartar building up already. I need to get him in for a, for a dental. I can't get him in until November. November 7th is the date. So I'm just praying that there's no tooth resorption going on and he doesn't have anything more serious than just needing to get, you know, a, a cleaning done. But yeah, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So I have to also ask you a question uh, that you get, I'm sure quite often is what are your thoughts about declawing? Oh, no, absolutely not. I am totally 100% against declawing cats. You know, it's, it, as you know, it's a, it's an amputation. I think cat owners think that, you know, it's, it's just removing the fingernail, that it would be like us just having our fingernails removed. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be great, but once it's healed, you know, it's, you'll get over it and figure out how to go on about life. But the difference is that it is an actual amputation at the joint. So it's really more equivalent to amputating your finger at the first joint. And the problem with that is, is that cats balance themselves on their toes. You know, they, they walk on their toes. So when we amputate the ends of their toes off, then they shift their weight back to their heels. Well, this causes all kinds of problems. I mean, it starts to cause back issues because they're now walking not naturally the way they're supposed to walk. You know, not to mention, I think in 85% of cats, there's residual pain where the surgery has happened because there's so many tiny bones in there. A high percentage of them develop bone spurs, you know, if, if not quickly later on down the line. And then when they go to use the litter box, they associate that pain with the box and then they want to go somewhere else where it doesn't hurt. And people wonder why they have litter box issues. I'm, I'm really happy to see that vets are now 
learning how to do those corrective surgeries and and going back in and being able to x-ray the feet and see that there's bone spurs and things going on and able to go in there and and actually clean that up and give the cats some relief. But I absolutely wish they would hurry up and make it illegal in the United States. You know, it's illegal in so many other countries and I'm embarrassed by the fact that it's not illegal here. I really am. Yeah, I, I agree. And there are just so many cats that do come into the adoption centers and they have behavior problems and it's no fault of their own. It's has been created because of this procedure. So I'm yeah. with you 100%. Do not, do not get your no, cat declawed. No, there are other, so many easy other ways to keep your cat from clawing up things you don't want them to claw. And if you're that kind of person that just can't stand one little tiny scratch mark on your sofa, then you probably should get a snake instead because <laughs> any dog, any cat is is going to unintentionally, you know, scratch the surface even if they're using their scratching posts full time. So, you know, if you're if you're that sensitive about your property, then cat ownership is probably not for you. And um, so, yeah, I'm I'm absolutely fully against it and heartbroken when I, I see cats who have been declawed and and having behavior issues. And I do get some not not a huge amount, thank goodness, but um, but some. So at the Community Cats podcast, we have what's called the TNR certification workshops, which we have the first Saturday of every month. And it's really a program that we offer for folks that are totally brand new to trapping. They see two or three cats in their backyard. They want to do the right thing. 70% of the people who attend these sessions are not affiliated with any organizations. What sort of advice would you give someone who is brand new to TNR and community cats? Well, first of all, that's awesome that you're doing that. I'm assuming it's done like by Zoom or remotely. So anybody could attend anywhere across the country. Anywhere. That's great. Around the world. We get it from around the world. Oh, that's awesome. And is it a is it a free podcast or do you charge for the certification? So the certification classes, which are usually the first Saturday of every month, it's a $10 charge uh, for that uh, session. And they get the recordings for a year's time and get access to our TNR test. And then we have six webinars that we do during the course of the year. Uh, trappers Tips and Tricks, Colony Caretaking Tips and Tricks, The Drop Trap, A Trapper's Best Friend. And we have three others. And those are free. So we have those during the course of the year. I mean, we're all about just getting folks the information that they need to be able to turn their passion for cats yeah. into action. Whatever anyone needs, we're here to help and find that information for them. Yeah. So um, around the world, around the country, individuals, organizations, large organizations, municipalities, we're all in this together. And, um, and that's what those programs are all about. That's great. That's really awesome that you're doing that. I will definitely share that because, you know, I get lots of people that are like, well, well what do I do? You know, where do I start? And, and how do I, and then it becomes so much trouble that they give up, you know, mm-hmm. first, first you got to find a trap. Well, do you got someone you can borrow a trap from? Do you have to go buy one? Now do you have to make an investment, you know, and then, then you got to learn how to use it. <laughs> and then, and then, then you got to find a place for that cat to go to get spayed and neutered pretty quickly because it can't live in the trap. And that becomes an issue certainly now where you can't just run down and, and get on someone's spay and neuter docket right away. You know, how, how do you do that? So Mostly now people are teaming up with with the organizations because they're the ones that are set up to deal with the cats once once they've been trapped and and how to make all that happen. And so, yeah, that would be great if if, um, if you have a resource to help people learn how to do that. Oh, we certainly do. And then also at the Community Cats podcast, we do a range of other educational programs. We have an online cat conference, an online kitten conference, United Spay Alliance conference. So it's like a whole weekend of spay neuter conversations. Some of the the topics we were just mentioning earlier, Uh, we do an online behavior day as well as uh, diversity day, return to home day and a fundraising day. So a little bit for everybody. Um, and we just have a fun time. I try to make it fun. We have cat trivia, a lot of polls. I love polling the folks that are in our sessions and finding out more about them. And we do have a online cat conference, Facebook group 
where folks can continue to get to know each other and meet one another. That's my virtual lobby, basically, for the events. So we're small. We're a grassroots organization, the Community Cats podcast. That's just a group of about four of us working on this project. But we really want to be as far reaching as possible to it's no one should feel alone in this. And I, I just imagine somebody sitting in their car at two o'clock in the morning, waiting for that last cat to get in the trap. They got the Dunkin Donuts coffee and they're just like, I'm the only one who cares about this cat, right? <laughs> it's just me. Nobody else cares about this cat. And I'm going to say Stacy cares, right? We care, you know, Molly cares. We care about the fact that you're out there. You're the one who's out there trying to get that cat. And there are more people like you out there doing it. It's a yeah. family. It's not just one individual person. It is. It is. And it, and it's amazing work. I mean, it's, it's amazing work. You know, my, my focus is on, on behavior and keeping owned cats in their home and working with shelters. You know, it's kind of a two pronged once those cats get in the shelter and they're behaving poorly, how do we get that turned around and make that cat more adoptable quicker? You know, so um, yeah, it, it absolutely takes a village. Everybody's got to, got to do their own little slice of the pie to make it all work out. So it's, it's awesome what you're doing. So Molly, how can people find more information out about what you do and the programs that you offer? You can find uh, out about me at cat behavior solutions.org. And then our weekly podcast is Cat Talk Radio, and it's it's simply at cattalkradio.com. And there are podcasts on just about every behavior issue you can think of. And if it's not there, then by all means, email me, molly at cattalkradio.com, and tell me that we need to cover that, and I will get right on it. <laughs> we're always looking for content suggestions. <laughs> Excellent. There's anything that you'd like to share with the folks out there dealing with community cats, what would you share with them? Oh, it would be mostly, you know, again, my perspective is keeping your own cats, you know, peaceful and, and that kind of thing. And, and just understand the amount of stress that that can cause your cats by seeing the community cats outside and figure out how you can support the cats that are outside as well as take care of your own cats, you know, talk to your neighbors. Do these cats belong to your neighbors? You know, do they not, are they being fed? Do we, you know, how do they look? Are they healthy? Do we need to try to get them into, you know, to a vet? Do you find places to feed them that are out of sight of your own cats so that you can support them in a, in a meaningful way? you know, and talk to your neighbors about it. And everybody's either got a homeowners association or a neighborhood watch group and bring it up and try to find out what's going on in terms of the community cats, you know, and then again, there's, there's very humane deterrence. If those cats are causing a nuisance in your home, then there are a lot of humane ways to discourage them from hanging out in your yard or crossing your yard or, or things like that. Excellent. Well, Molly, this has been a lot of fun. This is the first co-show I think I've ever done. <laughs> uh, it's been fun. It has been fun. So thank you so much for being a guest on the show. And I hope we'll have you on again in the future. Absolutely. And thank you for being on Cat Talk Radio. And hopefully we'll have you on again. And I will absolutely share your, in fact, just tell everybody where do they go? What's your website too? Yep. To our website is the communitycatspodcast.com. Uh, we also are on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of those places. Just search Community Cats Podcast. You'll find us there. We have all sorts of information, but usually the first Saturday of every month, we have our TNR certification workshops. So you can check those out as well as lots of free webinars, lots of content. Uh, join the Community Cats Podcast and turn your passion for cats into action. Yeah. And I'm going to share that with all my trapping friends. Sounds great. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think and a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats. Wow.